The first rule of quantum mechanics is that you do not talk about quantum mechanics. Just kidding. In this video, I want to discuss one of the absolute core foundations that the theory of quantum mechanics is based on. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. So theories in physics are often based on a set of ideas that we assume are true. In some cases, these ideas seem to make sense to us. And in other cases, as we'll see shortly, these ideas are just a big WTF. Either way, these ideas that we assume to be true in order to build a mathematical theory are known as axioms or postulates. I like to think of them as the rules that govern the theory we're looking at. And this is the first part in a series of videos where we'll discuss the various postulates or rules of quantum mechanics. But before we look at the first postulate of quantum mechanics, let me give you an example of some of the other postulates used in another theory that may be a bit more familiar to us. Let's look at the kinetic theory of gases. This is the main theory we use to predict how gases should behave in real life. One of the assumptions we make about the gas that we're trying to understand using the kinetic theory of gases is that it is made up of lots of little hard spherical particles that are so small that the total volume of these particles is much smaller than the volume of the container that they're in. Now, this is a reasonable assumption to make when the gas is indeed in a fairly large container. But what happens when the container becomes small enough that this assumption starts to break down? Simple, our model also starts to break down. Our theory starts to break down. In this scenario, our mathematical theory or model is not going to fully accurately model our real gas. So that's a very quick discussion of some of the assumptions or postulates of the kinetic theory of gases. We're thinking about small, hard spherical particles whose total volume is much smaller than the volume of their container. For a more in-depth discussion of some more assumptions made by the kinetic theory of gases, check out this video up here. But the point here is that the kinetic theory of gases is based on some things that we assume to be true, our postulates, if you will. Let's now take a look at one of the postulates of quantum mechanics, or at least the most commonly accepted formulation of quantum mechanics at the moment, known as the Copenhagen interpretation. In this theory, the first postulate says that for any quantum system that we happen to be studying, there must be an associated wave function psi. So for example, if we're studying a single electron, then this is our system. And directly related to this system is a mathematical quantity known as the wave function. The wave function represents our system or our electron because it is meant to have a single value at every point in space and in time. To understand why this is useful, let's first imagine that we are studying our electron at one particular moment in time. Let's say exactly 4 p.m. UK time on Tuesday, which is coincidentally also when I upload videos to this channel. But anyway, let's say we just want to focus on the electron at one particular instant in time. For this instant in time, we can work out the wave function of this electron. As I said before, this wave function can have a value at every point in space for this given point in time, even if this value is zero in some places. To see how this wave function has anything to do with our electron, let's simplify things even further and imagine that its value is zero everywhere except for along this line in space. We can now plot a graph of the wave function value at every point along this line. It would end up looking something like this. Now, in reality, the wave function has some value at every point in space, meaning it will have some value even between the points we've drawn. So it's actually not a set of dots on our graph, but rather a continuous line. But how does this continuous line correspond to our system? Well, this is how. If we take our wave function and we square it, technically we take its square modulus, then what we find is a probability distribution, or in other words, the likelihood of finding something out about the electron when we make a measurement on it. In the most simple case, the wave function tells us the likelihood of finding our electron at different points in space. The way this works is that we take the square modulus of our wave function and we find the area under the graph between two points, say A and B. This area directly gives us how likely we are to find our electron between A and B. So for example, between these two points, the area under the curve is big. So we're really likely to find the electron here. 
But for these two points, the area under our wave function squared curve is small, so it's really unlikely that we'll find it here. This is how a wave function corresponds to the system itself. Another system, maybe another electron entirely, may have a wave function like this, in which case we're much more likely to find it somewhere here rather than the positions that we were likely to find our first electron. In other words, that's what the wave function has to do with our system. We can work out or calculate a wave function associated with every quantum system we're studying. Now, at this point, there are a couple of things worth mentioning. Firstly, there are some properties that the wave function needs to have in order for all the mathematics to work and for everything to make sense. Well, as much sense as possible anyway. We'll take a look at these properties in a while. But the other thing worth mentioning is, why on earth should there be a wave function that corresponds to a real system? Why is there this mathematical function that seems to tell us about the probability of finding our electron if we take its square modulus of all things? The answer to that is, to varying degrees, we don't yet know. That's why it's a postulate of quantum mechanics. It's one of the things we assume to be true. In reality, of course, physicists would have discovered by doing some complex maths that there is this weird function known as the wave function that behaves like this. And then this idea would have been turned into a postulate. There must be a wave function for every system that gives us this sort of information that we've seen already. Maybe one day we'll get some more intuition about why this wave function exists. But the fact is that this mathematical formulation makes some ridiculously accurate predictions about how the universe works. In other words, we can take this strange mathematical formulation and use it to work out how our system should behave in specific scenarios, and then we test it. And what we found so far is that all the predictions made by quantum mechanics have been verified by experiment. Anyway, so let's quickly discuss some of the properties of this wave function. The first property is that it follows what's known as the Schrodinger equation. This is the main equation in quantum mechanics, and essentially what makes a function quantum mechanical in the first place is the fact that it changes over time and space as given by this equation. Another property of the wave function is one that we've seen already. The probability of an experimental measurement, so for example, the chances of finding our electron here when we try to measure it, is related to the square modulus of the wave function. Why? Again, we're not yet fully sure. This is another postulate of quantum mechanics. A third property is that the wave function cannot be any random function we can think of. It has to be normalizable. This means we must be able to ensure that the total area under the entire wave function can be set to one. It must be a finite area, in other words. The reason is because we know the electron is somewhere in our universe. Therefore, the probability of finding it between minus infinity and plus infinity must be 100% or 1. It must be found somewhere within the universe, and it must be guaranteed to be found if we tried to look for it everywhere. More on the normalization property in this video up here, and we'll discuss this last bit in the next video in this series when we look at another postulate of quantum mechanics. For now, though, I'm going to finish up here. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know what other physics topics you'd like me to cover down in the comments below. Check out my merch link down below as well. It's a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. Hit that like button and of course subscribe for more fun physics content if you enjoyed this video. Hit the bell too if you'd like to be notified when I upload. And finally, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of my Giga patrons and all of my other patrons as well over on Patreon. Once again, link to that down below if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your support as always. I will see you very soon.